Um, yeah, we're recording great. Welcome folks. This is cloud and Kubernetes failures and successes in a multi everything world. Uh, we are Fairwinds, Kubernetes done right, which we'll get to in just a second. Um, today, uh, speaking at you, we have Corey Quinn, who Corey, I will let you introduce yourself. Yes, I do a lot of things. I'm the chief cloud economist at the Duckbill Group, where we fix the horrifying AWS bill, a problem that afflicts everyone in the fullness of time. I also write the Last Week in AWS newsletter, host the Screaming in the Cloud podcast, and recently we launched the MeanwhileInsecurity.com podcast and newsletter combo, which is written by someone who actually knows what they're talking about. It's a busy year. It's a busy year. Um, I'm Kimball. I'm president at Fairwinds. I don't write any newsletters um, or any of those exciting things. Uh, I've been at Fairwinds for, well, I was the first hire. It's been six years-ish coming up on and um, been in the Kubernetes world almost that entire time. Uh, and Ivan, over to you. Yeah, my name is Ivan Fetch. Uh, I'm a solutions architect with Fairwinds and I spend my time helping folks uh, do Kubernetes as best as is, is humanly possible for their life and their customers and uh, occasionally write some blog posts and uh, happy to be here. All right, excellent. And real quick, a little bit more about Fairwinds. Um, you, you heard a little bit from me and from Ivan both mentioned Kubernetes. We are a Kubernetes focused company um, trying to help others do Kubernetes the right way. I think uh, a lot of people are very interested in Kubernetes, but intimidated that they don't know how to do it because it's a whole new paradigm. So Fairwinds has something to offer for just about everyone who's touching Kubernetes. We have software, a um, SaaS tool that, that does configuration validation, policy enforcement, governance, security, et cetera. Uh, we also have a suite of open source tools because we manage infrastructure for so many different companies running Kubernetes at scale. We see what some of the macro level problems are, everything from RBAC management to uh, staying on top of deprecated APIs, et cetera. Um, we probably have an open source tool that is relevant to you if you're using Kubernetes. Um, we also offer services. So that's primarily um, a lot of companies come to us and say, make my Kubernetes problem go away. And we can build and maintain your Kubernetes infrastructure for you um, from day zero all the way through long-term management. So we have something for you if you're in the Kubernetes space, uh, feel free to check us out. Um, we will be talking a little bit about Kubernetes later on, but um, the point of this is to talk about multi everything as well. So. Uh, first of all, if you are running Kubernetes, we have a poll, where are you running it? And is it one cloud, single region, one cloud, multiple regions, multiple clouds, on-prem data center and cloud, something else? Hosts um, and panelists can't vote is what it tells me. And that's good because I said there was going to say there was no option for in the dumpster. Well, you, to be fair, you run it on an array of dumpsters so that you have some, um, you know, um, high availability needs. It should apparently the branding folks inform me that they prefer the term IBM cloud. <laughs> wow, that's uh, that was good. That was good. And we're just getting started. And we're, just, and yep, we're not gonna we're, only we're, a few minutes in, folks. <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to rag on all of the clouds uh, because some of them we don't consider clouds. Exactly. Um, but uh, we'll give that a second to trickle in. Go ahead and make a poll selection and we'll count down from 10 and uh, then we'll get those results sent over and I'll share that so that we have some feeling for where folks are before we dive in. Pick a button, any button. Okay, Dave, you can close the poll and Survey share that says. with me. We'll, we'll get those results in just a second and I'll share them, but let's dive in. In a multi-everything world, do you go multi-cloud? So what we're going to be talking about today is all the options that you have. Multi, you know, you can have multiple CI CD platforms. You can have multiple clusters of Kubernetes. You can have multiple clouds. You can have whatever. So we're backing all the way up to the IaaS layer. Of course, now my dog's uh, barking in the background. Let's start with IaaS. He's defending um, IBM's mediocre name. That's right. Do you go multi-cloud? So let's talk about the advantages and different ways that we even can go multi-cloud. Ivan, Corey, 
Are you gonna are you gonna stand up a, a Kubernetes cluster to federate across? You know, one master to federate across all the clouds, or where do I'm you get started? Absolutely not. I was waiting for your dog to to, to yeah, answer. Yeah. Actually, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so in how's terms the Kubernetes of Kubernetes cluster these days, pooched. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so no is the answer to uh, what we often hear described as a stretched cluster. So a single cluster that you attempt to span across, you know, multiple data centers or or regions or or multiple clouds. Um, the the control plane latency requirements, uh, among other things, make that not a good idea. In a nutshell. Yeah, I, I want to oh, clarify as well that yeah. I routinely dunk on multi-cloud as being a terrible idea, but that's often misinterpreted. What I'm talking about being the bad idea is exactly what you just described, Ivan. The idea of like, oh, so you're all in on AWS. Are you going to use WorkMail to run your email? Good Lord, no. Why would I ever do that? I use Gmail like a reasonable person might. Uh, but it's on a per workload basis. Yeah, pick best of breed. That's awesome. What I can't stand is the idea of this, oh, one workload. We're going to build it to seamlessly migrate between all providers. As a, as a general statement, that's bad. Don't do that. There are exceptions, but they're not the common case. Yeah. The, uh, I mean, Federation was this big thing. I think when Kubernetes in particular first came out, everybody was really excited. Okay, now there's one API to rule them all. It's going to manage clusters across multiple data centers. We can just stand up a master and then host all the things across all these different clouds. And, and to be clear, there's still like Anthos is out trying to do some of this still, right? And Tanzu some of this, uh, run it in your data center and on the cloud and federate across these different things. And it's one thing to have a unified control plane or even a single API to interact with all these different things in different clouds. But it's another thing to try to stretch that cluster federated across. But, uh, but it was an easy thing places. to tell the story for all the, the marketing pitch deck. All you had to do was a find and replace for the word OpenStack. And then you go with that. You can take <laughs> out that whole Kubernetes story to the world. It's true. It's true. So it's, it's, so, it's understandably appealing, right? Right. To um, when you're, when you're looking to, to stretch your architecture in some new way, um, it's natural to want to do the thing that you're already doing. And couldn't we just make it stretchy? Couldn't we just like stretch this corner and stretch that corner and just kind of uh, make it go over there where we need it. And it's, it's, a, it's a natural first sort of reaction for, for humans to have. And there is still federation uh, works in, in process, right? That are, that are interesting. And, and, you know, there's a SIG federation um, or multi-cluster rather in the Kubernetes community. And there's other groups that are that are doing federation stuff that that, that looks cool and interesting, but uh, a, a, a general opinion opinion that I have that's of course subject to it depends engineering responses as well is is that you can you can federate your Kubernetes cluster, but I think by and large that advantage of the feeling you get when you have a single control plane that stretches across some kind of boundary is far outweighed by the complexity that you get uh, having to maintain kind of the, the federation machinery for all that kind of stuff. Well, so there's, there's other options that are um, that are simpler that we're going to get to. That's, that's even assuming that latency isn't the problem too. But I, I understand yes. like, hey, if you have built multiple AZ uh, high availability <clears throat> clusters of any kind, or you were doing that even before Kubernetes, uh, the idea of like, hey, now we can spread it to another region within the same cloud, or hey, why don't we just spread to another cloud so that we can fail over in the easy, it looks really good to a CIO who doesn't actually understand the complexity of implementing that or maintaining that or all those things. Um, not to rag on all CIOs. Some of them are really bright and really understand all of their things, but uh, I no, understand- No, they're there mostly to catch the blame. I mean, that's, any good corporate uh, DR strategy includes a ring of ablative CIOs that whenever they hit a snag, they can publicly fire the person and roll out the next one. It's like the space that's shuttle files right. on reentry. Is it like well, a so, so dispenser of CIOs? Yeah, well, the, well, the solar one's approach to do it with interns, but I just find that's a little, yeah, it only goes you know, dispensers, you just knock the head back and then, you know, flick it in the throat. Uh, so the results from the poll, just to, to frame some of those conversations as we go, we had 14% of respondents say they are in one cloud. We had 33% of the respondents say one cloud multi-region. 18% said multiple clouds, which well done people, we'll get to some, some more about this. And then 40% said on-prem and cloud, which actually makes a lot of sense to me. I know that that's a thing that it, while people are making this migration, usually running some things on-prem, some things in the cloud. But let's talk about 
cloud agnosticism, which is another way to do multi-cloud, it's to say, we're gonna build everything so that we can use any cloud and we can flip the switch the moment we want to. And uh, Corey, you wrote a blog post about us for our company a while back about the foolishness of cloud agnosticism. Tell, tell yes, me why that's you're, that you're reducing everything to a common set of primitives, which looks like a bunch of VMs and maybe an object store. And even then, it, it's not quite the same because provisioning times are different, failure modes are different. If you don't know how something breaks, do you really know how to operate it? And you're effectively having to rebuild anything higher up the stack between different providers that your application might possibly need. So while you're sitting there trying to figure out how to build the exact kind of load balancer and HA proxy and stuff it into a container that your app needs, your competitor is actually you know, building a feature their customers want. The only time that people, you should really be building a load balancer in service of what you do is if you're freaking F5. The rest of us just take the one that our cloud provider, the cloud provider gives us and move on. Yeah, well, I mean, the beauty of cloud agnosticism is on paper, you can go to AWS and say, you, you, you better negotiate better because we'll just flip a switch and jump to this other cloud. And like, that's just not actually a reality for most people and even, okay, for anyone, like in theory, that's possible. Years ago, somebody came to uh, to us as a company and said, we want you to build us a control panel so that we can run Kubernetes on any cloud and it will look the exact same and we can flip a switch and jump to another cloud. And we want you to maintain that across all three clouds. And like, y'all, this is like, in theory, you could do that, but it's like building a single control panel to fly a Cessna or a 747. And at some point the 747 can only do the worst things that the Cessna can do and the other way around. And it's it's a bad idea. Well, Go ahead. Larry Ellison got on stage for a while and said, oh, Amazon hates us, hates us, but they're still on Oracle because they've been building their own database and having all these really smart engineers working to move off of it. And it's taken them years and they still can't get off of Oracle. And wait a minute, that talking point doesn't say what I thought it meant. And it, it's an awful story where, oh, I will take my business elsewhere. Cool, great, have fun with that. It's like, this is like the cloud equivalent of the Falkland Islands War, where it's, oh, you wound up offending the UK, we'll see you in three weeks. And it's, okay, you can see it coming from a long ways away. It, you, people aren't going to migrate $80 million worth of cloud spend in a fit of peak. They're just not. So, right. and again, I, I think people also lose sight of the fact that what do you, what is your big, what do you plan to do uh, this year? Oh, we want to beat the shit out of our cloud vendor in a negotiation. You get that they run your they run your production infrastructure, right? After the deal is signed, you have to work with these people. And maybe burning time. everything to the ground in favor of getting an additional 3% off is not the best approach. Also, not for nothing. Turn some stuff you're not using off and you'll save way more than that. But no one wants to hear that. No, they want to have uh, the lawyers play slap and tickle for years. And while it's not it's equal, well, the, the, the savings is, you know, it's also moving mo money to just different expenditure buckets, right? So the, the engineering cost of all that work and consideration and actual work yeah. of, uh, you know, retooling, uh, retooling your brains. If you've got a bunch of engineers who, who know one cloud and you're going to move to the other, you know, they might be motivated to do that. If you're, well, they're like, going to migrate to your company, to another company down the street, because right. again, if you're really good at Azure and you haven't dealt much with AWS and well, we're moving to AWS, like, great, I'm moving to another company where I can work on Azure. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. You're also locked in with identity across the board because IAM is different between providers. Networking never quite works the same way. And unless you're active, active, deploy it across those different clouds, it's like a DR plan. All right, I'm going to go ahead and do my DR plan. And you finally get it working and it sits in a binder. And you try to do it again if you're one of those rare forward thinking companies that test DR before they need it. And <laughs> oh, it doesn't work. And you iterate and iterate and finally get it working. And you update the binder and the next commit breaks it again. Unless you're yep. active, active, it's not real. Yep. Well, yep. and so let's, I mean, let's round out this thought. We've talked about how cloud federation stretch clusters aren't really a thing, how cloud agnosticism is also not really a thing, but there is such a thing as multi-cloud or running in your database and running in the cloud and running the workloads that make sense to run, or not in your database, in your data center, and running the workloads that make sense to run in your data center, which there's always gonna be reason to run some things in your own data center where you have complete control over it. And there's always gonna be reasons to run certain things in certain clouds. Yeah, I know. You can, you can, you, we can, we can niggle on that, Corey, but uh, like Ivan at Fairwinds, we manage across three different clouds in a relatively sane way. What does it look like to actually try to make things as uniform as possible, but leverage the best of the cloud? Can you say a, a little bit about how multi-cloud in that sense is different from these other ways we're talking about it? 
Yeah, it, it, it definitely adds complexity to do it. So it's, it's for sure not a free, uh, a free thing, right? So uh, having, having workloads or having your processes span multiple clouds is, is of course doable, but you've got to realize the, the complexity that it's going to add to uh, your engineering team and to the kind of higher level abstractions that you're going to have to maintain but potentially depending on you know whether you want to uh, dig a little deeper on each cloud and understand it and and you know not have the sort of weakest link in the chain problem or or like your your Cessna 747 uh, analog you know the same kind of thing um, so you know ideally you're driving uh, a multi-cloud approach by your your business and your customers uh, not by like like I saw something in an in-flight magazine and so now I want to do a multi-cloud in terms of how do we accomplish these kinds of things at Fairwinds, you can use you know, infrastructure as code and you know, tools such as Terraform and there's other things out there like Pulumi and, and you know, someone that help you declaratively define your infrastructure in some sort of codified way. And those are gonna also let you have uh, a layer of abstraction. And we, we tend as a discipline to love abstractions, I think, right? We, we uh, in fact, it relates to a lot of this kind of cloud agnosticism topic as well that that there's this this drive somewhere in us as humans to abstract something away so much that it's not labelable or recognizable as cloud x or cloud y and so you have to be careful yeah. with that as well right let's let's yeah. abstract absolutely as much as we need to but the more we abstract the less value we lose from from any of the clouds yeah less value we gain uh Corey, what were you going to say Remarkably little these days. I, th I think you're, you're, oh, you're spot on. If you're going to do it, do it right and do it intelligently. But I'm also going to point out that in the position of Fairwinds, where you have customers in different clouds, you don't get to be judgy judgy as far as, oh, we're only going to support a single cloud for this workload. You have to wind up being, meeting your customers where they are. So if you're, like, this is where the don't do multi-cloud does break down, where you have a customer requirement to be in a given provider you'd better be there. They're not going to be your customer. And well, that's fine to be clear. Yeah. And, yeah. and there's a difference though, between when somebody comes to us and says, Hey, we want to do X, Y, or Z. And we say, Hey, there's some reason why this cloud might be better for that kind of workload. What do you think about running this there? How often does that need to interact with the rest of your infrastructure? What are the latency requirements? What are, you know, like there's those kinds of things where we can have that conversation and go into depth about it. But yeah, it doesn't, uh, you're right. I mean, there's some amount of we have to just say yes, but there's a lot of things we say no to, Corey. We don't operate Oracle Cloud, which may surprise you, uh, but that's just because- a credit where due. Oracle Cloud is not horrible. It really isn't. It sound, I know it sounds like it's something I'm making up to set up a joke, but it's technically excellent. I've been, <laughs> I have a VM that has been running there for over a year now, and it works. It's sitting there doing its thing. It's a free tier. And I'm not talking AWS free tier where surprise, you're now going to pay Amazon 20 cents a month for the rest of your life for no apparent reason. It's actually free. They have never charged me a penny. And do you just, do you just ping the machine to see what the uptime is? Sometimes I log into it and try to misuse it as a database, but that's a separate problem. Oh, that's exciting. It has had um, some results. Well, Again, it's cloud. Things go down. That's fine. If you're, yeah, yeah. if you're app, if you're, if you can't withstand the reboot of a given node periodically, I, I have some thoughts on your application architecture. Yep. Well, so let's let's shift gears a little bit. We've covered a lot of these things. Why does the CI? Why does your CIO love the idea of multi everything? I mean, options are great, right? And some of it is for negotiating power. I want to be able to go to one vendor and say, "Hey, I'm going to switch to another because I don't like the way you've treated us or you've charged us too much." And Corey, you touched a little bit on you. You can let the bridges. I burn light the way, uh, you know, that's that's going to come back and bite you kind of mentality. What do you, you're, you're well, holding I, in? I think it's a little unfair to say that they're multi, they love every multi everything. They're generally fairly bearish on the idea of multiple CIOs. They generally want to be the only one. <laughs> and there, there's a lesson to that. It CIOs like the idea of optionality. Because remember, back in the olden days, when you would give all your all your money to one vendor in a space, like Cisco or Juniper or Dell, it doesn't really matter, or NetApp. Again, no one was immune from this. Uh, if you're all in on one company's products, you're, you're basically a fool. Because at some point, you would go out and do a market research as your VAR has been riding you like a naughty little pony for the last five years. And you're overpaying and you're too deep in the weeds and you wind up losing out on it. You always want to have multiple vendors that you can go back and forth between. Cloud doesn't work the same way, but 
Most people don't graduate from uh, school, or if that's the path they go through in the more traditional background, and then become a CIO the next year. So CIOs, in most cases, are senior career folks. They, they have been around in the industry through those, that era. So yeah, if I, if I were saying I'm going to go all in on one server vendor and sign an exclusive contract with them, my CFO would hit me with a belt because that, you know how that stuff works. Cloud is very different. Yep. Yep. Well, and that, that ability to switch providers, enabling good negotiating tactics sort of looks good on paper. Um, having some options is a good idea, but maybe you don't need to be multi everything. And to Corey's point, a good arguing tactic with your CIO, if your CIO is really driven by this is, uh, um, well, let's hire one more of you, right? You want me to do two clouds. Why don't we get in a second CIO to oversee the second cloud? Yeah. Uh, you know, I think this, this, this uh, I think dovetails a little bit off of, of Corey's, Corey's point, but, uh, you know, there used to be a common, you know, data center thing and a security perspective where we, you know, you'd have like a firewall and you'd want to have diversity uh, of your vendors. And some of that was related to, um, you know, availability and uptime and, and hackability uh, of, of one platform over another and so on and so forth. And so we're, we're often motivated as an industry to, to try to diversify all over the place. And there's some, there's some goodness to that. And I think for me, the key that helps keep this in a, a reasonable realm and not, not get too far off the rails is that uh, back to kind of my earlier bit of, you know, try to have this be driven by true business and, and customer requirements sure. because, and, and that can be morphed a little bit into, oh, let me rationalize a thing that I want to do and try to like jam some business requirements into it. There's always that, but if you need to be in another cloud because you truly think that the diversity of the reachability of your app or like you've got some customer base or some other resource that you need to access that is truly closer, quote unquote, because you also are in this other cloud, then yeah, I think explore that. And, but also be, be eyes wide open to the, the complete engineering cost that it's going to take for you to know both clouds well. The abstraction yeah. stuff that we talked about earlier is an abstraction for a certain level of engineering maintenance wise. It doesn't mean, however, that your engineers somewhere in the company don't have to know more deeply both clouds because the troubleshooting stuff is gonna re require you to still be able to dig deep. And you're, you're still running on their nuanced resources and you need to know those nuances. Yeah. Yeah, the nuance is a significant part of that. So let's, let's talk about in a multi everything world, what can be standardized? And an example that I want to start out with is back to my Cessna 747 example. You know, it, it, this is a world where a airline has a fleet of the very largest and very smallest. Well, I guess 747 is not the biggest anymore, but ignore that. Uh, you know, airplanes, and they want a pilot to be able to be trained on one system, get in and fly anything, right? Now, there's some sense in that. And, and the example I think of is like Southwest who has decided their entire fleet is going to be some sort of 737. Now there's 737, 500, 737, 700, 737 maxes, right? And, but in theory, a pilot for Southwest can get into any Southwest airplane because all 737s have the same uh, control panel and they know how to fly it. And so you don't have to maintain this huge army of pilots that you're you know, training some on some machines, some on other machines. Everybody gets trained the same way and it reduces cost and it makes it that you can throw anybody on anything and they understand the problem. So there's a lot of parallels there, but the, the interesting parallel is sometimes you introduce something new, like what happened in the 737 MAX and then people die. Right now, in theory, most uh, of us and what we are maintaining is not going to lead to people dying. It's going to be an introduction of code and something breaking. But uh, that is where that analogy, unfortunately, carries on. And um, I think there is a way to standardize in a sane way. And it can also lead to problems if you over standardize all the things and, you know, really, really, really focus on notching everything into the same thing. Um, I mean, would you all disagree with that before I move on? Does that make sense? Does yeah, my analogy even work? I, I think I think that that a lot of this is uh, you know there's there's not necessarily a ton new to say that we've we've kind of touched on uh, that that value of appropriate levels of of standardizing or abstracting right and so yeah. it's kind of the that that same weakest link in the chain uh, scenario so yeah I think that uh, standards are good 
um, you know, a, a Kubernetes layer on top of whatever compute you have. Uh, even even that even that Kubernetes layer being composed of multiple clusters, not trying to have a single control plane necessarily, um, is is a, is one right. nice option, of course, that that we deal with on a very regular basis to try to provide a standard API to a majority of people that are going to be interacting with the the quote unquote platform. And we could also talk about platforms and who really needs them and how everybody wants to build their own, and that's a whole other thing. But um, yeah, I think it's. It's worth helping to um, alleviate pain for decent sections of your staff and people that are using your thing by having a standard layer that could be a Kubernetes API. The standardization on that, like what's interesting about that is, yes, standing up Kubernetes is different on any of the three clouds or in your data center. Mm -hmm. But once it's stood up, you do have that standard API to interact with. And so, you know, people can And your developers that. know exactly what the environment is going to look like from the application's perspective, which means that we can all sing kumbaya in the DevOps world about breaking down the walls between dev and ops. But in practice, that means that dev and ops never need to speak to another one again, uh, each other again, because everything is just, oh, as long as it works in a containerized environment <laughs> running on something that vaguely sounds like Kubernetes or Kubernetes, however they want to pronounce it over there is great. I don't even have to be in the same building as those people. Kubernetes. Well, and then once you have a standardized process, you can document that standardized process and it can stay the same. And I mean, this is the beauty of APIs all along, right? Is that you can standardize on an API and that API you're going to interact with the same way for a long time because the API standard, the API documentation process for interacting with it is going to stay the same in theory for the most part for a long time. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, everything else can change, right? Um, okay, good. I think we've, have we beat that to a dead horse? I think we're still drawing the important line around it helps a section of your, of your folks, right? Your, your DevOps crew that's, you know, managing apps and deploying apps and so on and so forth. We're not claiming that, uh, you know, Kubernetes is, is operated completely the same across clouds. So back to that engineering cost thing that I, I want to harp on, cause it's a real number that can sometimes get swept under the couch cushions. Uh, that you know, Kubernetes is going to operate differently uh, in terms of you know how does the upgrade cycle look in one cloud versus yeah. another if you're running a managed Kubernetes service and uh, one cloud forces you to upgrade on a certain cadence, another cloud is like some kind of behind often on on their Kube versions and uh, the potential for downtime when you upgrade Kubernetes clusters is different depending on how that's operationalized in cloud. So sure. you still need to know all of those things and. It's a big part of where we spend our time working in the clouds that we do, of course. But um, those details are still very, very important. But ideally, your applications are architected so that they can fail over and they can survive upgrades, node failures, all these things in Kubernetes, right? So ideally, your applications are yeah. architected, period. Very yeah. often, they're just or sort of organic. Like that spackle becomes load bearing. Right. <laughs> that's 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 cloud a cloud totally... spackle, of course, being mm -hmm. Lambda functions. Yeah. Okay, let, let, me go, let me go see what domains I can register that have to do with cloud spackle. Excuse me real quick. Kendall, you want to move on to the next section? <laughs> that's, that's right, while well, you're focused on, on going and registering domains. Hey, I, I do want to pause for a moment and say, uh, there is a Q and A in um, Zoom. that should be across the bottom of your screen. You'll see a little Q and A there. You are welcome to ask questions there. You can also put them in chat. In theory, we will see both. Um, but Bonus uh, points for questions aimed at Kendall, questions that are, Kendall that are actively insulting. At bonus points for questions aimed at me that are actively insulting, especially if you don't know me, because then you have to basically pick on my appearance or something I've said just in this, uh, both of which are, are fair game. So go for it. Target rich um, environment. Target rich environment. So Corey, I want to talk about best of the options available, because I know you love Kubernetes and you think it's the future and your savior. Um, if you are going to standardize on a few of the things, what are some suggestions you have? Standard, like you're, you're, you're going to standardize on CI tooling. You're going to standardize on logging, on alerting, on, you know, and you don't even, you can name tools if you want to name tools, but how do you go about choosing what the best are? Well, Understand that best is always going to be contextually bound. What's best for you may very well not be what's best for me. So I'm speaking in a very general sense of things. But I who do you get kickbacks a, a from so that they're universally the best? That's part of oh, what no. we need to... Again, one, in serious, one of the things I do point out is I have no partnerships with any vendors. We don't do referral fees, none of the stuff like that, because it's 
conflicts of interest are very real. People can pay me to appear on things and to sponsor my nonsense. They can buy my attention. They can't buy my opinion. And I, I want to be very clear on that because mm -hmm. turns sure. out you don't have any authenticity left. No one cares what you have to say anymore. And I don't. Gosh, I'm trying to, to make a company. joke, not not launch you into a disclaimer, Corey. Keep going. No, no. Oh, the best joke come with a disclaimer. I mean, look at the disclaimer <laughs> they read before every Oracle keynote. But what's fun here is that when you start looking at things to standardize on, you, uh, build and release process is going to be a right way, the right way to go. Usually, that involves having a common source of code. I prefer Jithub, but you know, some people like to use Bitbucket or GitLab or. If you know if they want to do performance art they'll try something like aws's code commit but let's be serious we're talking about customers here and that that's great you want to have the similar flow because honestly you don't want people to have to go through different development flows depending on what environment something's going to run in you're going to want to have certain things that are defined on-call schedule should probably not be varied based upon what environment it's running in and as you move up the stack you talked about yeah telemetry monitoring observability which they get really offended when i call it what it is hipster monitoring but that's the sort of thing that you want to wind up having that is almost certainly through a third party using the cloud providers native options for logging and telemetry is a fool's bargain don't do it i'm kidding because it's the only kind of bargain it is it is criminally expensive yeah the um i mean you're going to need hipster monitoring because you need to know what's happening uh you're going to need i mean and and there's also the, 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 in the best of options, you know, are you going to build versus buy? There's all those, everything in ops is a trade-off. Uh, and you do have to sit down and figure out for your organization. And some of that is cost. And some of that is keeping options open and sometimes landing on two things because it makes the most sense for you to have two options. Maybe you have Jenkins somewhere in your workflow and Circle CI somewhere in your workflow. I'm not saying you should do that. I'm saying there are places where that might be the best option for you is to have multiple options for some reason, because you need to have tight control over something and uh, you know looser control over something else. But um, sitting down and deciding what are the best options is an essential part of making any of this multi everything work. Uh, and you know, I work at a Kubernetes company. Um, so I'm just going to say you should centralize around Kubernetes, all the things, because uh, obviously that's the best API for it's working. It's not, in seriousness, it's not the worst approach. I mean, there's this whole perceived divide between containers and the world and serverless world. And my position on it, which I'm sure I will get email that I will not read, so that's fine, don't at me, is that serverless is what I would build on if I were doing something greenfield. But there's a whole lot of legacy out there in the world. And legacy is condescending engineering speak for it. it makes money. What does that ancient piece of crap do? Oh, about $4 billion in revenue a quarter. So watch your mouth. It's, you don't get to burn everything down and build it from scratch very often. And you have to have a story to get it from wherever it is now, like in the failing data center that is currently being dismantled by a pack of raccoons, but and have that move into a cloud without a complete refactor of everything that is built on. Containers really are a good story for thing. that to call an IT team a pack of raccoons. I haven't heard that yet. No, no, no. Um, the but, walls uh, have given out and there's now a den of raccoons that is currently <laughs> under the under the sand. Don't ask. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, there's there, like, you have to land on something. There is place and time for serverless things. Even, you know, you can run serverless inside of Kubernetes. You can run it. Uh, there's other things that standardize that too. But, um, you know, one, one of the best there and part of the reason that Kubernetes is one of the best options is because of its wide uh adoption and because you can find a plugin for it for everything it's like when your marketing team just wants to use wordpress because they know they can click a button and get all the other things now there's all the downsides of wordpress don't get me wrong uh but it sure is nice to click a button and get hey, plugins last anyway, week in aws runs on top of wordpress and through wp yep. engine because i have the good sense not to wind up running wordpress myself having done that at large scale previously but under the hood that's right i looked at who it was using under the hood last week in aws.com lives on gcp Oh, nice. That's exciting. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, at least did last time I checked. They may have deprecated GCP since then. It's been a couple days. Well, it's, <laughs> it, it's since this morning. You never, you never know when GCP will be deprecated. I mean, that's this is a very good, uh, you know, segue over to in a multi-world everything simplify. And if your job is making snarky comments about AWS, simplify to GCP because you never know when you'll get shut off. Uh, right, Corey? I mean, you, in theory, they could come after you that way. 
Um, I don't think they've done that, but um, no. you know, the, the simplification. I, I can joke, but when I first started this, I looked into it and I wound up because they could theoretically come after me pretty easily on trademark grounds at some point. And it was I didn't know much about the company when I started, so I also owned Last Week in the Cloud dot com. And if they had, cool, I can change that over in twenty minutes, and now I'll talk about you and your competitors. Good move. They didn't. They've always been nothing but gracious around that about my basically stomping on their trademark, and always you know been. it's appreciated. So I, I yeah. don't worry about business decisions where they're going to turn you off. It turns out that people like to say, oh, what if your cloud provider turns you off? It's, what are you doing that's going to make them turn you off? Because, spoiler, you know one of the things that's in common between all these cloud providers? That's right. They like money, particularly when it comes from you to them. So they are not incentivized to turn people off. It's it's pretty rare. It does happen, but it's extremely rare. And even there then, the lines are farther than you think they would be. And there is a uh, counterpoint though. For example, like what if AWS simultaneously loses all of its regions at once? Now, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna bet that that's not going to happen. However, it is often easier to have a backup going to another cloud provider than it is to try to explain that to your auditor, your regulator, or your insurer. Yep, 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 yep. Smile, nod, check the box. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, the reason that I, we're landing on Simplify is there are options all the time out there. We've talked a whole bunch about this. The reason for the options, the reason some of the options are bad ideas, uh, everything from IaaS down to multiple options for deploying, but choose a delivery mechanism, choose a way to deliver your workloads, a sane way that can stay the same for a while. Uh, outsource that if you want to, you know, pay for a third party SaaS tool that does delivery, choose a delivery target, something like Kubernetes that you're going to deliver to that has a sane API. It doesn't always have to be Kubernetes, deploy into other things. Uh, Enable a full service ownership model, which isn't actually doable without standardizing on some things. You, in order for your developers to actually have service ownership, the meaning building software on their computer that they own all the way through to production and are responsible for, if it goes down in production, requires standardization of enough things that they understand what's going on. Uh, because they probably are not DevOps people themselves, they're probably developers who are interacting with the platform uh, in most of the situations. Right. Um, and with that simplification and standardization and uniformity, that's when you can start to form around best practices and implement policy, which is uh, really where I'm going with this. Um, because until you standardize, you can't get to policy. Policy is untenable with too many options because you can't enforce policy across everything everywhere. And this is something we see some of our customers do at really big scale, things like any developer can spin up any Kubernetes cluster anywhere in the organization as long as that cluster follows these company policies. And then they can fiddle with things wherever they want to. And it gives a lot of freedom because they can enforce uniform policy across you know, some kind of uh, standardized system. Um, and, and lucky for you, I have a nice demo that I'm gonna pop into. And this is where I'm gonna make a shift over to Fairwinds Insights and some of what our software does. This will be a very brief demo about uh, where Fairwinds helps with multiple clusters and running in multiple places and how we can make some of that sane. Um, but again, we're gonna save some time at the end for some questions. So if you wanna go ahead and ask questions while I'm doing this, this will be a quick demo, but um, Fairwinds Insights is a platform that we've built at Fairwinds to enable same policy enforcement across lots of clusters. Does it have dark uh, mode? This, does it have dark? Not yet. That is actually pretty low on our priority list. Uh, yeah, because who would ever have to look at their Kubernetes uh, cluster in the middle of the night due to an outage or something? I, I, I like to keep my outages to business hours as well. Okay. Continue. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I like that. Um, so let's say you're running multiple clusters. In this example, I've got a organization running just two clusters, alpha staging, Proxima plot, prod. They have logged into Fairwinds Insights, and this is what it looks like. I'm going to click into the production uh, cluster here, and uh, we're going to give you a whole bunch of information at this high level on this dashboard, including a health score for how the cluster's doing. Um, and we're saying, you know, this, this cluster gets a B minus. This is uh, taking a whole bunch of things across policy or across security, reliability, and efficiency. And when we say efficiency, we're talking about costs, management stuff, um, as well as, you know, resource requests, et cetera. Um, there's a whole bunch here. We do some cost analysis. I'm going to dig into a few things. 
But uh, let's say we want to look at some of the action items that Fairwinds Insights is reporting. You can see here we're breaking down things according to security. We also have uh, reliability and efficiency, as I mentioned. And in security here, we prioritize danger versus warning items. I'm going to click on a danger item, and this is going to tell me something that's going wrong in my cluster that we have using Fairwinds Insights and some of the logic on the back end said, this is something that you really need to fix. Uh, this is the problem. And then importantly, this is how to go about fixing it. And part of the reason this software exists is we've seen a lot of people stand up Kubernetes and they want to use it, but they're intimidated by it because they don't know how to do it right. And that's why we're trying to make this as easy as possible. We're going to show you what you've configured wrong, what's insecure, what's inefficient, et cetera. And we're going to tell you how to go about fixing that. So you install an agent on your cluster and you get this big report, a uh, whole bunch of things you can work through and knock off. Uh, and then again, they're prioritized, danger, warning, et cetera. Um, there's a whole bunch more here, but I'm going to be very high level. If you wait until something's already broken in your cluster, this is a prod cluster saying, here's all the things that are wrong, right? You're a little too late. And so we have integration in the CI pipeline. Uh, here we have GitHub and um, click this button to fix. Well, I'll, I'll, there's a question came in. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, but so here's an example of um, somebody who's pushing code with a container set to run as root and insecure permissions to the container. So you can see CircleCI is passing the test, but Fairwinds Insights is failing this deploy to keep it from happening because you don't want things to get into I'm your feeling awfully called out right now. Yeah, that's good. That's good. This is the point is to make you feel called out. So average developer is going to interact with it that way. They can click a button, get pulled into here, and it's going to show them this is what needs to be, this is what's wrong, and this is how it needs to be fixed. So this way, again, your average developer doesn't need one more dashboard to go in and look at. That's for your boss to look at, see how you're doing, see how you've improved over time. Your average developer just wants to know, what do I need to fix so that I can get my things deployed? And this is a way to interact with that. We have that in the CI process. We also have that as an admission controller. Uh, and then finally, there's um, a couple of other things here I just want to show at a high level. We do some workload analysis to talk about cost. And we break down, here's a you know, Jenkins pod running. We're paying $3.66 per month. With our recommendations, that'll go to $1.16. You're going to save $2.50 per month. Probably not worth a lot of your time. That's only one pod running. If you have hundreds of pods or thousands of pods running and they're over-provisioned, uh, this can dramatically affect your regular spend. So you click on this and it's going to bring up some uh, workload recommendations. This is what you're paying. This is the memory that you're currently requesting. This is what we recommend. And that's how that's where that cost change comes. There's also CPU here. I'm going to close that out. You can click uh, you can click on cost settings up here and make those unique to your your cloud as well as you know um, put in some custom costs because nobody has uh, there's no such thing as AWS pricing. Everybody's paying something different. So you can go in there and put in what you're actually paying per you know, certain type of instance and get very uh, much much closer to very accurate um, cost analysis. All right, just to so, be clear, are you talk, when you say everyone paying a different rate, are you referring to spot pricing or are you referring to custom negotiated discounts? I mean, custom negotiated rates. Cool. Uh, yeah. For those wondering so, and who've not encountered those things, those generally start about a million bucks a year in AWS spend. If you're spending more than that and still paying retail price, stop that immediately and yell at your account manager who's probably been assigned to your account within the past 20 minutes because, let's be perfectly honest here, most containers have a longer shelf life than AWS account managers. Yep. Um, so let me answer a couple questions about this. We've got one question that says, coming soon, click this button to fix. Uh, in theory, you there's a lot of these things that could be done that way. Click a button to fix. The problem is, is that what happens is then the software is reaching back into your code, reaching back into your container, making changes without all of the knowledge of those things. So in theory, we can go that way, but we're probably a little ways away from that because there's going to be a lot of complexity and hairiness involved in uh, this being an automated way to go back in and make changes to your application stack. Uh, the same reason that we don't at a you know huge AI level say click a button and fix all the things uh, or the same reason that you know our workload recommendations require manual changes because um, when you turn these things over to AI uh, or a computer making all the changes all the time bad things happen you can leveraging the vertical pod autoscaler and Kubernetes give Kubernetes control over all of your workload resource requests uh, but there's a reason that people including the you know VPA, as I understand it, saying probably not a good idea right now for production workloads. 
Um, is it okay for a container to have root privileges? Uh, Ivan, you want to talk about why that's maybe not a great idea? I think this says a knit container. Uh, oh, maybe that's what it's saying. Yes. It look, might be a little bit of a typo there. And so I apologize if I'm incorrectly uh, deciding what your question means. But um, so if you're specifically calling out a knit containers, I would say, I would say no, uh, no in general to containers having root privileges. You don't want containers to have more privileges than they need uh, ever. And having root privileges in a container can give that container a lot more rights on the node where it's running than, than you really intend for it. So it, it's one thing if there is something that you're doing in your app where you regrettably need some kind of root access because of, of I can't think of a good example. There used to be examples that don't apply anymore. Um, so no is the is the short answer. Yeah. Um, okay, and there's, uh, let's see. Yeah, he, he did clarify, he was talking about init containers, which I think you addressed, right, Evan? Yep. Um, so, uh, and then Eric has clarified, see syncs auto-generated PRs in GitHub. Actually, that's a great point. I like that idea for a way to implement the click button fix. You don't want a click button hot fix, you want a click button PR. I like that idea. That's, yep. that's probably where that will eventually go so that it can be reviewed before it's merged in. Um, and uh, yeah, are you really sure sequence to implement something like that? That's a great idea. Um, what is under the RBAC page? Well, thanks for asking. So I guess you want to you see more, I'll click that button. So um, what we're doing here is bringing to light all the different RBAC roles and bindings. This is, uh, Fairwinds has an open source tool called RBAC Manager. And Ivan, what's the other one? RBAC, um, it's fixed. Lookup is, it's a, mind, right? is a RBAC lookup. command line yeah. tool. Right. And so uh, there's open source tools that we have built because we recognize that people have a difficult time managing role-based access control. We're pulling in some of that here and showing who are the most privileged uh, permissions, who are less privileged, and what is like read only. And so this gives you a high level overview. It's not giving you suggestions because every organization's RBAC implementation is going to be different. Rather, it's, it's showing you these are all the different roles that you have available in your cluster right now and what they're privileged to do. And so you can click on that and just get a high level overview. It's a quick way to be able to uh, audit what those roles look like. Um, and then again, we have other tools for actually managing the, the in and out of uh, RBAC. Um, let's see. Um, do, 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 do. I mean, it's just from the beginning. Yada, yada. Okay, I think we've answered that. Um, and let's see. Yeah, I think we've answered that. And on the Corey esque snark tip. Okay, Corey. Uh, any chance y'all change your company name to avoid being confused with solar winds? Wow. Uh, if we're getting confused with solar winds, that would be bad. But so far, that has not been a problem. If anything, the uh, confusion that we get more than anything is there is a um, large credit union based out of Florida called Fairwinds. And so we have a lot of people who come to our website, request a sales call, and say, uh, well, I haven't heard about Kubernetes, but I'm wondering if you can help me with my checking account, uh, that kind of thing. You should partner so, with a company called Following Seas. At least then you'd wind up having a uh, something vaguely poetic. That's right, Fairwinds and Following Seas. There you go. Um, okay, well, I think I can switch back over here. Um, and just to wrap up, we do have a Kubernetes best practices white paper. Again, I am firmly of the belief that everybody out there increasingly is moving towards Kubernetes because you've seen the buzz around it, because you've seen that people are talking about it, that the uh, juice is worth the squeeze is what I will say. Um, but it is new if you um, have never used Kubernetes, it's intimidating. It's like moving from Windows to Linux. Linux is great once you're used to it, but Linux is really weird and difficult to configure if you've never used it before and all you're used to is Windows. Same thing with Kubernetes. So we have made some of that easier with our software, but we also have this thing, Kubernetes best practices. Uh, if you want to know more, go to our website. Uh, you can request a live demo of Insights. You're welcome to talk to our sales team, set up a free trial for that, run it in your, um, in your own cluster, learn all the things we're going to show you, but also feel free to grab this and just... Um, dig through Kubernetes best practices according to Fairwinds, who runs lots of Kubernetes at scale for a lot of people. And um, I think we can wrap up there. Ivan, Corey, any last thoughts to leave our audience with before we go? Uh, 
we could close with some you on the spot. unnecessary hot takes and really cause some damage on our way out. How about <laughs> now? Kubernetes is not a terrible direction to go in for a lot of different use cases. And if you're going to do it, do it right. I mean, you're, you can expect an awful lot of terrible decisions to be made in the next year or so as the world opens back up and senior executives once again are being exposed to airport advertisements for enterprise software vendors. So you want to be able to at least contain the blast radius mm -hmm. of those things. So that's what the that that's the, the way to do it. If it were me, I would my best way to run Kubernetes personally, I don't. I let professionals do it for me. It's easier slash better slash the best kind of problem in the world. Someone else's. So go hire Fairwinds. That's what Corey said. Exactly. Um, no, no, I said and, professionals. Uh, hire the <laughs> hire the professionals. I, I'm not running those clusters, thankfully. So we, oh, we okay. do have the that's professionals fair. on that. Yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> Well, amazing engineers managed by a circus clown. Yeah, that's hey, somebody's got to, you know, I don't know, juggle. Um, thanks for attending, folks. We appreciate your time. This has been, uh, you know, a multi everything world and where Kubernetes fits in that and best practices around it. Appreciate you attending. Thank you all.